answering subscriber questions. That's what we're all about. We think we finally got enough information now. We can talk about building a WRX80 system. And uh, the motherboard we're going to choose, well, I hope you'll stay with us because uh, this is about not only answering subscriber questions, but we're going to look at the what, why, and how about building a WRX80. When we get finished, then we'll do a summation of uh, are you better off on the WRX80 or are you better off on the uh, TRX40. And at the end of this, the next video is probably going to be about the TRX40 where we think we have a solution for that D4 error. So I hope you'll stay with us. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Builder Buy. I want to thank you for joining us. Now, as we get started with this, some of the questions to come up with the WRX80, we've got three motherboard choices. We have four processor choices. And of all those choices we have right now, there's only one motherboard shipping. We have four vendors that has that motherboard possibility. And there is one vendor that has two possibilities for motherboards. And I will say, of the three motherboards we have, which is Asus, Supermicro, and Gigabyte, Right now, Gigabyte, my first choice would build one on Gigabyte. But if I had the opportunity to build two, I'd like to build one on Gigabyte and one on Asus. The Supermicro board, we're going to go through some specs and look at some information. I want to start at the beginning with the Lenovo so we examine uh, some things that I think are critical features. But when we get to the Asus, the amount of documentation that Asus had, I think is, is amazing, incredible, and pretty exciting, especially if we get into RAM. Because remember, a computer's always been made up of three components, RAM, motherboard, and processor. But now, that's no longer the top item. One, because of availability. And uh, number two, because of uh, what you're doing depends on what choice you're going to make. Your video card really plays a big, a big part in this, whether we go desktop or whether we go more workstation. Because remember, we're building a workstation computer, but we still have access to desktop components. And our goal has always been about price performance. What's the best bang for the buck? So... As we go through this, there's space relations we have to consider, uh, slot and lane assignments, PCI Express resource allocation. I've got a couple of articles I will put up that I won't get into with this video that you can look at later. Some people smarter than me that are into some of this stuff that goes beyond what workstations can do. And I kind of think what's going on with Gigabyte, and this is just my guess, it's either got something to do with the uh, Thunderbolt, which I have some thoughts about that I'll save for another video or else they are busy with the new AMD Epic server that's been announced. And I got to tell you, if I had a chance to build an Epic server because someone says I want a workstation, based on the chipset, I would step back and I would stick with the WRX80 because I just think that's got gobs of everything of what we're going to need if you want to go with a real workstation. You know, if you're looking at like a couple of video cards or if you're looking at four video cards, um, which, which brings up a lot of questions, but let's, uh, let's start with the basics of the RAM motherboard and processor, and we'll build on that, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I hope you guys are excited about this as I am, because i got to tell you, there's some really cool stuff going on that uh, really makes you think about, you know, where this is at, what we're doing. And, uh, and a lot of people have said, you know, what would you build? I'm eager to see what you would choose. Well, the question is always about what you're doing, because from my perspective, it's content creation. And as I, as I step back and look at this, I've been doing content creation really since day one. We've always been chasing the ultimate computer. What's the best bang for the buck? What's that price performance ratio? So as, as we sit here now looking at this, uh, from my perspective, my perception on this reality we're dealing with, when we first built a Ryzen, we built a Ryzen second generation. I believe it was a Ryzen 1800. Now it's blown way past that. I wouldn't build another Ryzen because of what's gone on beyond that. So we had Threadripper 1 and Threadripper 2. And we built a Threadripper 2 second generation, uh, which was the uh, X399. Great. PCI Express 3. Love it. But then we got access to the TRX40. And uh, the TRX40, wow, that's an amazing platform. Two 16-lane slots, two 8-lane slots. And I've got some information I'll share where one engineer said, uh, because this goes into the workstation doing deep learning, it's not about PCI resources. Some people are into that. I'm one of those that's into that because I'm into chipsets. Chipsets are what rules. And if you're just doing video cards, that's one issue. But if you're doing M.2 cards, that's a completely different issue. And if you don't have enough PCI Express lanes, you cannot run those cards. The number one question we get are everything about M.2, specifically M.2 cards. And number two is about Thunderbolt. So I try to give you my perspective on how I see that. And, and we got a lot more of that to do as we've got some more heat tests we're going to be working on. As I said, we're going to be working on the D4 error code. And I think we figured out how to do a vertical mount for PCI Express 4. The mount's one issue, the cable's another, but I'm going to say that for another video. But as it relates to this system, trying to build the WRX80, 
uh, changing one thing changes everything. For example, on a desktop, everything's always been regular RAM. We go for what the spec is. It's not about the speed of the RAM. It's about the quantity of the RAM. So we look at DDR4-3200. We're not interested in Samsung BDI RAM. That, that, spe speed, that speed spec is not the issue. It's about the quantity of RAM. So as we look at a video card, we have to think about what kind of rendering projects are we doing. Now, I render video. Sometimes I render animation. But, but even that kind of animation that I do is not graphics intensive. Uh, on the whole, most rendering is 90% CPU with 10% on the GPU. So you have to balance that. What kind of GPU do you need? I still think, in my opinion, for content creation, RTX 3080 is a great deal for the price. But what's come into play is the slot allocation. How, how many slots wide is that video card? Because no matter the resources you've got, if your video card's too big, it's not going to work. So what we've come to understand as we've dealt with this TRX 40 is the slot to that video card. Okay, the other issue we came into, which was from our last video, was as we look at slot assignment, is the, uh, the NV Link bridge to put two RTX 3090s together. We have an RTX bridge for the 2080 Ti, 2080, and the RTX 90, and we made that distinction. So because you're four slots wide, and you know, it's interesting as you look at slots on a motherboard, let's go overhead. There's two ways to look at slots. One, the actual slots on the motherboard, but also the I.O. slots coming through the back. In other words, this bracket in this box is listed as being four slots wide. But if you count the I.O. slots right here on the back of this case, what they call four slots wide as you count the slots is actually five slots. One, two, three, four, five. So however they measure that, on the TRX40, one of these uh, NVLink bridges for an RTX 90 bridges the two 16-line slots. So keeping it simple. We like to keep it simple. We don't want to get too far this way or too far that way, just right about in here. Otherwise, we get too far into the weeds. But, you know, all the details matter. So as you look at a video card, I still think an RTX 3080 is a good deal. But if you need the processing power, number one, CUDA cores, and then number two, possibly tensor cores, that RTX 90, that's hard to beat. But if you need beyond that, because you're not just doing video rendering, but you're doing something more like CAD and uh, that kind of architectural modeling or any kind of number crunching, uh, mathematical work, then you need something with uh, more processing power than just an RTX 3090 card. You're looking at a Quadro. And when you get into the Quadro cards, that's a whole other class. And uh, the fact that we could even put a couple of Quadro cards on a, TRX 40 is pretty amazing, but the fact that we can put maybe four quadro cards on the um, WRX 80, that kind of blows my mind. So you have to consider the platform where it's always been RAM, motherboard, and processor. But when you get into the WRX 80 platform where we have seven 16-lane slots, that's pretty wicked. Then the issue comes up, okay, I'm using a different kind of bridge connector. Don't have one here. We can take a look at some links. I won't in this video, but I'll put them up in the description. Uh, when you look at the link that's specific for a quadro, you still got to bridge slots. So my concern is if I'm bridging slots, can I use those slots underneath that video card? Possibly. It would have to be a half height slot. So then you're looking at like one of the Mellanox cards. I mentioned it before. Mellanox is now owned by NVIDIA. And what that would allow is, for example, in motherboards, we've had 1 gigabit, now 10 gigabit, which kind of blows your mind. But with a Mellanox card, we can go to 40 gigabit or we can go to 100 gigabit in a half height card. Uh, those are expensive cards, but if you need something like that, that means you've got two computers because no way most people are going to have a Mellanox switch. You look at the price of those switches for 40 gigabit, that's one thing, but for the price of 100 gigabit, most people are going to use that, are going to have computer to computer. So, you know, there's a possibility of using those slots, but for most of us, once you put that bridge on, even with a couple of Quadro cards, whatever's underneath there is no longer usable. So, the reason I mention this is because we're going to start with the Lenovo and I want us to look through some specs. And as we do that, it's interesting as you look at the spacing on the video cards, what you can actually put on the bus on that system. Let's take a look. The first thing we'll look at are the specs on the Lenovo P620 workstation. This is the Threadripper Pro. Now, Lenovo has their own motherboard and I'm going to show you some pictures out here in just a minute, but let's look first at the processors. If you were to build your own machine, as I've mentioned in previous videos, the two bottom machines share the same processor. That's the 3945. 
And of the four processors, we only have access to three. If you want that bottom end processor, this is the only way to get it, is if you do a P620 ThinkStation. Otherwise, the other three processors, the bottom of the three available, is the top, the top end of the one that's available through the Lenovo. These are options people need to think about and consider because as you build out, what is it you need to do? Where do you need to go? What is it, what is it you're building for? Because based on the resources on the Lenovo P620, um, in my opinion, I think you'd be better off with a TRX40 because if I want to really take advantage of the resources on the WRX80, I want a WRX80 motherboard that gives me access to it. So that gives me either ASUS, Supermicro, or Gigabyte. And again, Gigabyte, MIA. What's up with that? If and when the chance comes that we could build one, I would like to build one on the ASUS and I'd like to build one on the uh, Gigabyte. I'm not so much on the Supermicro, even though Supermicro builds servers. That's a stripped down bare bones board and, you know, for the price, fine, but for the resources and all the things that uh, we're used to getting, my first choice would be the ASUS motherboard. Now, the ASUS motherboard is going to include one of those M.2 quad cards. The Gigabyte board is supposed to include an M.2 quad card plus one of the Thunderbolt cards. Now, I'm not going to say Thunderbolt 3 or 4. Right now, it's spec'd at Thunderbolt 3, but I will say... Instead of holding off on this, Thunderbolt 3 is what I would expect. I expected Thunderbolt 4 to be PCI Express 4. Right now, Thunderbolt 4 is lipstick on a pig. All you're getting is more power. And of the three things that Thunderbolt 3 can do, it's still PCI Express 3.0. It's not PCI Express 4.0. So of the three things it can do, which is power delivery, 100 watts, I'm not real gun-ho on running power through a card when I'd rather just plug it in because I don't care what they do to uh, do signal regenerators, or to try to uh, isolate power. Any of you that have ever done audio through an audio interface and tried to run power through USB, keep it simple. Keep your power separate. So I'm not a big fan of power. That's not my thing. I'm not a big fan either of uh, trying to route video through Thunderbolt. Why not just plug video in directly? What I am a fan of is data connectivity. Now, I think that's pretty exciting. But Thunderbolt 3 cannot deliver the throughput on PCI Express 3 that it's promised because the PCI Express 3.0 bus can't do that. But that's all marketing hype. So anyway, enough about Thunderbolt. I still like to get a chance to build on the Gigabyte. Now, what concerns me about the Gigabyte, we can take a look at the manual, but the PDF manual they show, uh-uh, that's, uh, that looks like something we did a very long time ago. I, love, I find it a little disturbing, the uh, one-page PDF flyer that they provide is going to be documentation for that motherboard. It may be at this point in time, but going forward, uh-uh. I want to see more information. Now, if, as we look at the ASUS, we got some really good information, some stuff we can really dig into. So uh, let's go back to the P620 on the Lenovo and walk through the process because I want to show you what it looks like inside that box. So three different processors. The two bottom ones are the 3945, and their top one is the 3955. I find it kind of annoying when vendors try to obfuscate information that we're after. They try to sell stuff on, uh, like, look here instead of looking over there. What I want to show you here on this picture with the Lenovo ThinkStation, there are two video cards in here, and this says these are RTX 8000s. Okay, the RTX 8000 is a good card. We'll take a look at NVIDIA's site, and I'll show you where that sits in the structure. There's the uh, 4000, 6000, 8000, one above that. Now, with the RTX 8000, if you'll notice, those would be considered, I believe, let's double check the width. Okay, the specs on the RTX 8000, we look at CUDA cores, we've got Tensor cores, and we get down to PCI Express 3.0, that's another consideration. It's not PCI Express 4.0, but it is dual slot. And that's the point I wanted to show you. This is two dual slot video cards. Now, they don't have the bridge on here, and I'm really surprised, but if that's two dual slot video cards there's one it looks like a 16 lane slot and this may be i'm not real sure but that almost looks like an eight lane slot so that's two 16s or three 16s and an eight or two 16s an eight and a four and it looks like there's uh six sata ports down here the point that i want to emphasize is you can put in a couple of video cards two dual slot video cards so the spacing on those is a little bit different let's take a look at the bridge because you know you change one thing changes everything and again this is all about the WRX80 so even though we need RAM motherboard and processor that we've still got to get to and the motherboard I'll show you on ASUS what I want us to look at and examine based on the uh, 
Lenovo P620 Threadripper Pro is slot assignment and lane assignment for how it relates to that particular machine for those video cards. So it is what it is. You can only do so much with it. But if that meets your needs and that'll do what you need, then uh, that may work for a lot of people. But from my perspective, I'd like a little bit more bang for the buck. So that's where I'm coming from for the board. I tell you what, let's go ahead and go to Newegg and I'll show you the two motherboards that are available. Now, four vendors, other components that are available for RAM, motherboard, and processor. Okay, of the three processors that are available, Amazon's got a listing for the three processors, but no motherboards. What's that about? Kind of crazy. We can go to Newegg and I'll take and show you a link on that. We've got two motherboards listed. One motherboard is the ASUS, the other motherboard is the Supermicro, so we can do some comparisons. The other location would be B&H. B&H off and on has the listing for the ASUS motherboard. And the other place, the fourth place, is Micro Center. Now the advantage of buying from Micro Center, if you're buying the ASUS motherboard and a processor, they do a bundle deal, and I'll see if we can show you a link on that, where if you buy those two items or a combination of items from them, they'll knock $100 off the package, which makes that a pretty good deal. So it's about price, it's about availability, price, performance, what do you need or what do you want. Again, I'm still happy with the TRX40, but I'm really excited about the WRX80. So let's take a look and see what we can see over at uh, Newegg. Now Newegg has a listing for two motherboards. Again, the ASUS and the Supermicro. We can take a look at the price, performance, and what I like about looking at components at Newegg. Now what I want to show you here with the Supermicro, if you look at that, as I'll go back to the picture, we've got three M.2 sockets there, but there are no heat sinks. I like the bells and whistles with this particular board. That's something else you got to get. Now, if I had the opportunity uh, of either the Supermicro or the Lenovo P620, I'd kind of like to look at a P620 and see the BIOS, see how that sets up. Because there are some places in some parts of the world where the Lenovo P620 is their only option, the best way for them to go. So I would like a chance to look at that, get the BIOS up on screen and go through all that because there's going to be some peculiarities that if we can't find it in the manual, we need to be able to see it on the screen that I'd love to be able to show you guys. But if we can't, then I, I can only tell you what I can read about. Uh, we learn by doing, and if we can see it, a lot of time we're finding out, as you guys have seen, the documentation some of the vendors are putting out is just not up to snuff, not up to par. They'll do a revision on a motherboard and change one little thing, changes everything. Something supports on one version, but doesn't support on the other. I like to be able to see it. A little bit of that Missouri blood in me. Got that from a grandmother. But going back to this board, again, I like the six slots. I like the 3M.2, and I like the uh, network uh, information that's on there. But, I, but I just, it's just a bare-bones board. Another thing you have to consider as we look at building when we go from RAM, motherboard, and processor, and now we're looking at video card, and we've got to spend some more time on this because this is important. Before we get to RAM, looking at the difference in ECC and all the three types that are available. As we look at the resource allocation, depending on the video card you choose, it may affect the power supply you get. Let's go back to the P620, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Now, the P620, all three of these have a 1,000-watt power supply. Now, from my perspective, when we built the uh, TRX40, I believe we put in a Super Flower, and I believe this was a uh, Leadex Gold, and I believe it was 1,000 watt. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll have to take a look and check. But anyway, my point of reference is we used 1,000 watt. I think it's adequate for this, depending on where we think we're going to upgrade to. But based on that machine, to put a 1,000 watt power supply in, based on two of those cards. Okay, if I'm using a Quadro, I can live with that. But if I'm going to be putting in something like an RTX 90, uh, that might be a little slim pickings. I would want to increase the wattage on that power supply. Uh, you know, change one thing changes everything. And it's not just about the wattage, but it's about the connectors. Because as we look at the ASUS motherboard, I want to identify, again, some of those components. We've got more power taps, more power taps than we've ever needed before. And if you go from the ASUS board to the Gigabyte board, you add another power tap, depending on whose uh, Thunderbolt card. Thunderbolt 4 has an extra power tap. So that's something else you have to think about. And I'll show you some more information on some power supplies in a minute. But as we go back over to these boards and we look at this super micro board, if you notice the, uh, and this is just one of those little little tidbits of information, look at the I.O. panel on the back. There's no shroud on that I.O. panel. We've gotten so used to what they've done now with the, uh, I believe it was starting with the X399 with the TRX40. That particular motherboard has no shroud on it, so that's something else you got to assemble. It's just one of those little FYIs. Again, something else we've come to accept that we've come to know that in the beginning I thought it was kind of dumb, but now that we've been doing it, I think it's a good idea. There's not something there to mess up or fuss up to mess up with those connections. And I've, I've seen a few boards 
where those uh, panels didn't get put in right caused some problems. So it's just something else to think about. So now let's go back and let's take a look at the ASUS board. If you notice that back I.O. panel, it's already on. Nothing there to attach. Everything's covered. Everything is well uh, taken care of. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slots. Now when we get into the manual, uh, there's some other things that we can look at more specifically, but I like to look at a picture because sometimes I see things on the picture I don't see that are in the artist rendition of a drawing. But the documentation ASUS has provided looks pretty accurate. And uh, what we need to do now is take a look at the layout of that board. We'll look at the schematic diagram, but I want to see where those power taps are at. I want to see where those um, M.2 drives are at, and I want to look at those slots. All those slots are usable. All seven of those slots. Now, again, two video cards or four video cards, that limits what we can do, but man, the resources are there. Uh, there's a link I'm going to put up for you guys from Serve the Home that did a comparison of an RTX 3090 uh, versus a Quadro, and I think it's a good, fair comparison, but what kind of took me and blew me back was the system they used to test it on, an X570 chipset. I won't go any further than that, but the fact that they had the two cards to test it was interesting information. Uh, there's, there's lots of things to consider. I have read some talk about, well, you know, with the Quadro cards, and I had this question asked today. I believe it was David Cook made the comment. Okay, we know what NVIDIA is doing, and you can bridge two of those, either with one of these, which is the NVIDIA Link Bridge. Now, again, they have specific bridges for specific video cards, and when you change the technology, you need to get whatever brand you're getting. But for the... Uh, Quadro cards, there's a different bridge. It's a specific bridge. And the reason I want to mention that is when we get into a, um, let's take a look at the motherboard and see how resources are allocated. And um, we're going to look at the PDF. So we're going to go to the ASUS website. But there is a plethora of information there. Some of the best information I've seen. Typically in the past, whenever we went on to a new platform, a new system, it was always, okay, what RAM can we use? Well, PC Part Picker was one place you could go, but PC Part Picker hasn't updated, so we could look at a WRX80. I don't know if they will because it's a workstation. But I've always been able to go to the vendors, whether it was uh, Crucial, Corsair, whoever. Now, always in the past when we were doing something that was very specific, that had to have a specific type of RAM, we'd go to Kingston first, whether it was a laptop or a desktop. We've been doing that for years. So I have done the same thing with this to find out and ascertain what we can do. And I'll just say, even though the platform can go to two terabytes of RAM, for us to put ECC RAM on this motherboard, in retrospect, on the TRX40, we can go to 256 gigs of RAM, and we did, DDR4, 3200, non-ECC. But when we go to the WRX80, even though the platform can go to two terabytes, with Kingston technology for what they have available right now, we can only go to 512 gigs of RAM. Now, 512 gigs is double of the 256, but it's not the full 2 terabyte some of you may need. If you're doing the content creation for deep learning, artificial intelligence, and i got to say that that stuff is not in my wheelhouse, but I've been doing some looking into it because it, it borders on some of the things we've been doing with, with the kind of things we create. So those of you that have asked what processor would I recommend of the RAM motherboard and processor, my recommendation would be if we've done 256 gigs worth of RAM on this platform, my expectation on the next one, we're going to do at least 256 gigs of RAM. And because of the arrangement, I would recommend going to 512 gigs of RAM. And I do the ECC. Okay, let's look at the processor. A lot of you asked what I would go with. Again, depending on what you're doing. If I were doing the artificial intelligence, I want more cores, but it doesn't have to necessarily be fast. So let's look at what AMD's got. And AMD has us listed here for four processors. Again, the 3945, only available from Lenovo. So these three that are our example, 3995, 3975, and 3955. Based on the technology going from 16, 32, or 64 cores, if I were doing the deep learning, I would probably go for the 3955. And the 3955, as you remember, if we looked at the ThinkStation, that's what you get on the number three Lenovo P620 Think workstation, a 3955. Now, if you'll notice here, we go on the cards for the low-end machine from a Quadro P622 gig to a Quadro P2200 5 gig. And on the Threadripper Pro, they have listed an NVIDIA Quadro RTX 4008 gig. Again, if you need a Quadro card, I would step that Quadro card up. But I know it's about getting on the platform, but for the kind of work you might be doing for artificial intelligence, 
That third machine, based on the processor, based on the power supply, will do the job. Based on the video card, I'd go up with that. That's just my opinion. And uh, if you start with one, then you can go to two. But you have to remember those quadro cards are PCI Express 3. If you want PCI Express 4, you're looking at an RTX 3090. Now, will there be an RTX 30-something Titan? We'll have to wait and see. Nothing's been announced. There's been talk. But anything talked about is a rumor, up for conjecture. We can only guess. We need to work with what we got, and that's why we've waited. Now, most of the information I'm sharing with you, some of this is about two weeks old. I kept expecting to see something drop with uh, Gigabyte. Nothing. Crickets. So if that's the case, then our best solution, our only solution, primary solution, in my opinion, is ASUS. So build one with ASUS, then we'd go on, if we had a chance, and build one with a Gigabyte. Simple. If I could only build one, that was something I shared with you a while ago about the specs. If we're only going to build one, I would wait, and here's why. Because of our experience with the Ryzen, because of our experience with the Threadripper 2nd generation and the Threadripper 3rd generation, what we're looking at right now in the WRX80 is a Threadripper Pro 1st generation. There's going to be a revision on the motherboard, possibly. There will be probably more iterations of processors, my expectation. Now, where we're at with technology. Right now, we are with PCI Express 4.0. We're looking at PCI Express 3 and PCI Express 4.0 video cards. There's going to be PCI Express 5, PCI Express 6, and I expect we're going to see that around 2023. So right now, this is 2021. Um, that's some kind of uh, perspective to look at. A couple of years is not far off. And there's also talk about the new DDR5. We're now still using DDR4. Will we see denser DDR4? I would expect we would. Where we're at right now with this kind of reminds me when we were in Vista and we made that big leap going from uh, 4 gigs to 8 gigs. I won't, I won't get into that, but that just that is what this reminds me of right now with the leap we're getting ready to make. To me, this is that kind of leap. So it's not about being first, and if I could only build one. Um, if I'm building one right now, I'm building ASUS. But if I could wait, based on experience, I would build with a gigabyte. But if I could build two, I'd build ASUS now and Gigabyte later. Let's go back to ASUS and see what they've got because they've got the best information of anybody. So the ASUS motherboard, we've got overview, we've got tech specs. And again, I like to know my processor, my chipset. I realized a long time ago, chipsets rule. And once you understand that and realize how that resource allocation works, I had a conversation with another subscriber, and I want to thank you guys for watching. This also kind of reminds me of when we dealt with IRQs a long time ago. Now we deal with PCI Express lanes. So that, that too is a technology that uh, is an interesting resource as we try to allocate. But as we look at this motherboard and we look at the specs for two terabytes, when I get through showing you some of the things I want to point out, then we're going to look at RAM. Then it really gets interesting. So again, this thing can go to two terabytes. It's eight channel. And it talks about the DIMMs we can go to up to DDR4 3200. And it'll support... ECC, non-ECC, buffered, unbuffered, UDIMs, RDIMs, and 3DS RDIM. So when someone says, which one do I get? One place to start with is the QVL list. And that's a real eye-opener. We have seven PCI Express 4.0 by 16 slots. And yes, they're backwards compatible. Support PCI Express bandwidth bifurcation for Radeon CPU bifurcation, which is pretty exciting. What that means in English is the bid install an M.2 card based on resources on this motherboard, not one M.2 card, but several. And we're still going to do a video and compare the uh, Aorus M.2 versus the Asus M.2 on PCI Express 4. Waiting on a bracket so we can do our heat emissivity test. But uh, there are some differences and similarities, and we're going, to, we're going to do that in another video. But this would allow you to put more than one card in a machine. How many? Well, on the TRX-40, two 16-lane slots and two 8-lane slots. So we have a two slot video card and we have a single slot M.2 card. If we took the video card and put it in an eight lane slot, we could put in two Aorus M.2 cards in this machine. Now some of you might say, why would we do something like that? Well, if we put the video card in an eight lane slot, it's still getting more access to resources than someone that puts a video card in a four lane slot. You might say, well, why would somebody put a video card in a four lane slot? That's my point. And that's what you're doing with Thunderbolt. You're taking a video card that normally uses 16 lanes, you're putting it in a four lane slot. So what's up with that? I'd rather just plug it in direct, but that's, that's just my take on it. Uh, that's some more information we're gonna share in another video that'll, that'll get into some of that details. But again, back to the uh, 
WRX80, we have to have some perspective on, on our historical perspective of where we've come from to know where we're at, to know where we're going. Because if you don't need this, only build what you need right now. Because if you don't need this, you ain't going to use it. It's changing. It's changing quickly. The question is for the price performance. For some people, this is the place to be. If you need more RAM, this is it. If you need more PCI slots, this is it. But if you don't need those things, if you can make do with two 16-lane slots and two 8-lane slots, then the TRX40 is the place to be. But the WRX80, let's take a look at the RAM see what we can do. Eight SATA ports, three M.2 slots. And we have two M.2 that are to the CPU. And we have one M.2 that's through the chipset, which is kind of a bummer. An AS Media Controller. And that's probably how the SATA ports are configured. U2 slots that I doubt anybody will use, but they're there. And of course, the Ethernet, we have dual 10 gigabit Ethernet, which is pretty cool having that on the motherboard because uh, you figure what a price one of those cards are based on even just the ASUS 10 gigabit Ethernet card. Those are like uh, about 100 or so bucks a piece. So that's a couple hundred dollars. So that's a, that's a pretty good deal. But if you want 40 gigabit, Mellanox. And if you want 100 gigabit, Mellanox. And uh, putting one of those in one of these machines, well, that's another topic. But it's a resource that has to be considered. And yes, we have uh, Wi-Fi on here. And this has Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5, which brings up an interesting point about doing the Windows installation. Because it'll be Windows 10 Pro 64-bit, there shouldn't be any problem using the Windows Media Creation Tool with the existing drivers for Windows Build 2004. Now, until I get a chance to try it, I don't know specifically, but I don't see an issue with it. If it is, uh, that's based on the same things we have resource-wise in the TRX40. So if the WRX80 has those same resources, you're good to go with Windows Build 2004. No BSODs. However, if you do, then you got to slipstream those drivers. we got a video on that. So I just want to interject that. So we have USB ports and USB-C ports. It's got audio on board. I hope they do better shielding. But even still, if you're going to do audio, you need a separate audio interface. All right, now the exciting part here, let's take a look at support. Support tells us uh, several things. We have CPU memory we'll get to, driver utility, manual document which you need. Uh, what I like to know about is the BIOS firmware. And what's nice about this, anyway, the latest BIOS 12.18.2020, version 2011. So if we look at the CPU support, this will show all four processors if you could get your hands on that slowest one will all be supported by BIOS 0211. So if anybody's concerned about a BIOS or having to do a BIOS update, you don't have to be concerned about it. All four of the processors that are currently available, even though you only get your hands on three of them, will work with that motherboard out of the gate. So that's good to know. But here's where it gets really interesting. Memory. Now someone might say, which RAM do I pick? Right here is where I would start, and then we can go to Kingston. So what I want to look at is the type. ECC, RDIM, or UDIMs. I'm going to pick ECC, and I'm going to say even the vendors. I'm not even going to pick vendors. Let's just see what we have for ECC. So I've got V-Color, InnoDisk, Kingston, SK Hynix, Micron. Kingston is using Micron. That's what I wanted to know. So if I'm going to use RAM and I'm going to build uh, ECC RAM into a WRX80, Kingston's what I want. I like what they're using. They're using Micron RAM. So I can go with that. Now let's go to Kingston's site, and uh, let's see what's available. And I want to interject this. Anybody building a computer, when you're ever trying to figure out what you're doing, there's two ways you can look for your RAM. If you don't know and can't look in your manual to figure it out, download and install and run Bell Arc Advisor free. It will interrogate your machine and tell you what's possible. The other option is to go to a site like Micron, Corsair, um, G-Skill, and Kingston. Pick a vendor, go to their site. They'll tell you how your motherboard's configured, what it can handle, what size memory it can go in each one of those slots. Extremely handy. Also makes it easy. You can turn right around and buy from that vendor or go buy it from wherever you want. Now, we will have links up on the three processors that are available through uh, Amazon. And we will keep looking. And if you guys find it before we do, let us know. But as soon as that stuff is listed on Amazon, we'll get the motherboards listed. But right now, of the four places where the motherboard is listed, I'm going to get all four of them listed up. They'll be up there on the description. Uh, so let's go take a look at the RAM. We're going to go to Kingston Products Memory. We're going to do a Kingston Memory Search. We're going to search by device. We're going to enter model. We're going to keep it real simple. We're going to say ASUS, and we're just going to say WRX80. Let's see what it pulls up. WRX80, let's see what it pulls up. Okay, the ASUS Pro 
WS for Workstation, WRX80E-SAGE SC Wi-Fi. That's us. Now what's nice about this, again, it shows the bus architecture, what it'll support, PCI Express 4. It'll support the M.2, NVMe, and this says we've got one, two, three, four slots. That's interesting. Four slots are all I'm aware of. So I'll have to go back and check that out. But anyway, let's go on down to RAM. Now we've got Value RAM Server Memory, Value RAM Server Premier, and Solid State Drives. What we want, we can look over here if you'll notice the capacity 32 gigs. If we look at 32 gigs, these are all non-ECC. If we look at DDR4 3200, not what we want. Let's go to Value RAM Server, and these can go 32 gig or 64. So if again we look at 32 gig sticks, and we're looking at DDR4 3200, these are ECC, so that would get us 32 times 8 would get us 256 gigs of RAM. Okay, just simple math. Now, if we go to 64 gig sticks, and we're looking again at Value RAM Server Premier because we want ECC, we are looking at, if we go with DDR4 3200, we have two options. And if I check it over here for speed, it says 16. We have two kits for DDR4 3200. That's the 64 gig module. So of those two kits, both of those are ECC, and I'd have to check the difference in the part number. Price is the same. But if we just did a quick 64 times 8, there's our 512. So with ECC RAM on this platform, we can get this up to uh, 512 gigs RAM ECC. Now, if we were to go with uh, non-ECC RAM, we can get that count up higher, but we have to have denser chips. But that's where we're at right now, 512 gigs. So not a bad trade-off. Uh, you can always swap out the RAM later, but again, it depends on what kind of data set you're running. Now, from a, from a perspective of content creation, uh, the question has been asked, if I had a chance to build an ultimate machine for content creation, well, again, it's always about price performance. If we could build an ultimate machine for content creation, I would say we'd build a WRX80. I would still put the middle processor in it because I think it's the best price performance bang for the buck. But I would opt for an RTX 3090 video card, and I would probably put in two RTX 3090s. Now, for the kind of stuff we do, processor does 90% of the rendering, the CPU, and the GPU does 10%. Now, what changes that 10% is if you have something mathematical calculation intensive. Most of the kind of rendering we do for video is not a big deal. Uh, but the one application that benefits the most from a Threadripper Pro happens to be Adobe After Effects. So if we did a lot of Adobe After Effects or we had our own little render farm, a WRX80. And uh, depending on where we go with that, you know, a couple of RTX 3090s. But for most people, for the money, I just think that RTX 3080 is hard to beat. But when we got our RTX 3080, because we were in line in the loop to get it, I didn't realize how big it was until after the fact. And that's what put me on this path to share with you guys. Be aware. So RAM motherboard and processor makes up the computer. Uh, we've looked at the motherboards. I've told you what I think about that. I think ASUS is a good choice. I don't think you can go wrong with the ASUS board, especially on a workstation. Because if we were to step back and look at a workstation, which we were at one time on the X299, it was going to be an ASUS, an ASUS workstation. We were going to look at PLX chips. Well, now with this platform, there's no reason going backwards. We, we only want to go forward. So I'm excited and stoked. I'd like to have a chance to build on the ASUS platform, but I'd still like to build one of those on the Gigabyte and compare, see how those two perform. Now, as I said, there's a data scientist that has another perspective on deep learning. I'll put up a link to that. And also Serve the Home has a really good article about comparing an RTX 3090 to an RTX Quadro 8000 which is really quite fascinating. So this is kind of where we're at with building one of those kind of machines. Uh, I, I wish we had PC part pickers so we could uh, do the what if with this, but we have to do this the old fashioned way and hunt and peck. So we looked at what's available for the Lenovo. We looked at what's available. Uh, I didn't show you Gigabyte because it's missing in action, but we've looked at what's available from uh, Supermicro. I don't really want to go into the details of the Supermicro board other than it's a bare bones board. But i got to tell you, this Asus board has me pretty excited. I think that would be a great way to build a machine. And if I could only build one machine and I was building it now, it's Asus. But if again, to reiterate, if I had a chance to build two machines, I want to build the Asus now and the Gigabyte later. Now, when the Gigabyte is available and we have more information, you know, I always say change one thing changes everything. Based on the information, what I know about what's available, 
I'm still leaning toward the ASUS, but I'd like to build a Gigabyte because we have a history with Gigabyte. And yes, we've built on all the platforms. Uh, we've built with Supermicro motherboards back when they made a desktop board. It's been that long ago. Uh, we've built with uh, ASUS motherboards. It's been probably about uh, six or eight years ago. And we've built a lot with the Gigabyte boards. We've built the most with Gigabyte boards. But for a workstation right now, we're looking at ASUS. So we've identified RAM, Kingston. We've identified the processor, the one in the middle, which would be the 3975. 32 cores, 64 threads, a good place to be. Not interested in boosting the clock up. I'm just interested in we're 280 watts on all four of these. I'm just interested in uh, the, the cores. I think that most expensive processor is a most expensive processor. So uh, I would step down to that uh, 3975, which is just a kick up from what we're using right now in the TRX40. More resources, um, more stuff, we can do more things. I know you guys are going to have some more questions and some more comments. That's what we're here for. So if somebody comes forward and says they want to build one of these, that's the way I'm going to build it. But right now, for my money, I'd rather wait until we get second generation. I don't have a problem waiting for second generation. Uh, I want to see some uh, BIOS updates, and I want to hear some more information trickle down because there's leading, bleeding, trailing, and cutting-edge technology. And um, I don't really consider Thunderbolt bleeding edge technology, but with the issues we've had on Thunderbolt that's been around for 10 years, uh, it's still kind of bleeding edge. So this WRX80 is bleeding edge. You can build one. I don't think you'll have problems. But before I would build one, I'd like to wait a little time. How long? I'm guessing probably at least uh, six months, somewhere in that time frame. So again, if one of you guys comes forward and wants to build one, we'll do everything we can to help. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I think we need to take a look at power supplies right quick. Now we looked at the P620 and those have a thousand watt power supply. I think now we need to go back and take a look at the ASUS motherboard based on the PDF file. And uh, let's take a look at some resource allocation and see where things are aligned. Because uh, power taps are really important. So we need to look at that and then we'll go look at the power supplies. So we go to manuals and documents. We have one manual. We'll download that. Okay, here's the drawing I wanted to show you for the power supply. This is in the PDF manual. If you'll notice, we've got the one 24-pin tap. On each side of that, we have an ATX power tap, and we have another ATX power tap. So that's three main power taps in addition to the 24-pin. Now, if we we'll scroll down to the bottom of the motherboard, we've got two more down here, right here. And that's for PCI as well. Those are typically what's called your PEG connectors. So you've got a motherboard. Instead of having two, it has three plus the other two, that makes five. So that's five power taps. So that's five power taps of the 8-pin variety. Plus, you figure whatever uh, video card you got, there's two more power taps, 6-pin or 6-pin and 8-pin. So five, six, seven. Another video card, 8, 9. And then if you've got Thunderbolt, you're going to have two, possibly three. So that's 9, 10, 11. 11 power taps you've got to have to plug all this stuff in just to get it to work. So let's take a look at a power supply and see what kind of power taps we have. Now, if you do a couple of RTX 3090s that need 750 watts, you want to get a 1600 watt power supply. Brands I would look at would be like the Superflower, possibly the EVGA. I believe Asus has one. And uh, Be Quiet, I think, also has one. One of those four power supplies. So when you build a machine, talking about getting RAM, motherboard, and processor, the things that may hold you up will be number one, the video card, number two, the power supply. So size those according to what you think you need so you have room to grow with it. Let's take a look at what um, Superflower has and do a little comparison. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And then, of course, your uh, standard 24 pin. So depending on your setup, you're going to be tapped out. And that's on a 1,600-watt um, power supply. So it's not just about the power, but it's about the power taps. And I, I, don't, like, uh, I don't like using the cables that, that bridge. I want them to go directly mano a mano from uh, source to device. But that's one option. Now, if we go to Newegg and just do a search for a 1,600-watt power supply, we've got the Superflower. We've got an EVGA. Corsair also has one. You get an idea of kind of the price on those. And uh, Be Quiet has one as well. So look at, the, look at the regular places where you go to. I've uh, I found the Be Quiet power supply, I believe, on B&H. I'll put up a link to some of those components. 
because, uh, you know, again, it's about not only price, but it's about availability. And when you're looking at how you're going to build one of these machines, you've got to have a power supply that can accommodate the video cards. If you're going one video card, no big deal. And I would put at least 1,000, maybe 1,200 watts. Or do I build a WRX80? That's, uh, that's a question each of us that I'm sure will be asking for quite some time. Because what I like to do is go through the process, look at the resources, and say, okay, how much do I need to accomplish this task? Because it's all about the task. And, and, and everything, you know, you change one thing, changes everything. But I'd really like to build one of these and test and compare the two and see what we're doing. Uh, some things are about bragging rights. Th some things are about processing power. Depends on the task. But I hope you found this interesting and enjoyable. I try to get through this as quickly as I could. Any questions that come up and arise from this, that's what we're about answering questions. The one thing we didn't talk about was the case. And based on everything we know, I would love to be able to get one of those in one of these kind of cases to keep it compact. But um, I got to tell you, to be able to access all the resources, the best case for this is probably going to be the thermal take. Let's take a look. The thermal take W100 is probably going to be the best case for a system like this, considering what it has access to. If you look at this back I.O. panel, I can't move my mouse over there, but if you notice here on the left where I'm pointing, right in this area, there's a place there where you can do a mount, a vertical mount for a GPU. And that's one of the few cases that has that ability built into it. We're still going to be doing something about a PCI riser cable and riser card, but I'm waiting on a part because it's not about the riser cable and riser card, which is PCI Express 4.0, but it's about the video going after that, doing the thermals, getting the uh, heat emissivity test on an M.2 card. But as this came up, that comes up, and to build a WRX80, that just keeps staring me in the face. Uh, it's going to be hard not to build a machine of that caliber in a box like that because you, you got to have room for all that stuff that's in there. So I'll throw that out there for food or thought. If you guys have another case you think is a favorite, I'd love to hear from you. I uh, appreciate you guys would subscribe. And uh, in the next video, we're probably going to be doing the D4 error code. So if we've solved that, we're going to show that in the next video. So I want to thank you guys. You're amazing. This is Builder By. My name's Gil Boyd. We're out and on to the next video.